Well, praise the Lord. Thanks for uh, Hope Ottawa. Just love seeing you all here, minus like 100 outside. And, you know, praise the Lord. Was this like the frozen chosen or something here, huh? Praise the Lord. So glad to be worshiping with you all tonight. Let's open up our Bibles. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, put your hand up right now. Our ushers are coming forward, and we want to put a copy of God's Word in your lap. Acts 3, 1 to 10, and it is on page 531 in those Bibles that are being handed out to you. Well, very excited for this to jump back into our series in the book of Acts Again, the title for this entire series is To the Ends of the Earth. And there's a reason for that because, okay, who can tell me the main theme of the book of Acts? If you trace it from Acts chapter 1 all the way to the end of Acts 28, the theme of the book of Acts is? Oh, say that one more time. Witness. That's right. Good job, Hope. Way to go. Main theme is witness. And so what we've seen so far up to this point is we've seen the command, the command to witness that Jesus has given us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. One who testifies to the person and work of Jesus Christ, even at the cost of their own life so that others may live, so that others may live. We've seen the command to witness, but we've also seen, starting in Acts chapter two, the power for witness, the power for witness. This was at the day of Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit. We saw that in Acts chapter two, verses one to 13. And then after the Spirit comes, we've seen the result of witness as Christ's followers, his disciples, step out in faith and preach the gospel, things happen. And we saw that in Acts chapter 2, 14 to 47. We've seen that as Peter steps up to preach that Pentecost sermon, and 3,000 people are saved after that sermon. The church grows from 120 people to 3,000. And then last week, as Kevin unpacked for us in verses 42 to 47, we saw the outworking of that witness in the day-to-day life of the church through the uncommon distinction. And as, as unbelievers all around them saw the life of the church, they saw the joy, they saw the love, they saw the faith, they saw the devotion, they saw the generosity. They were like, what is going on Church testifies to Jesus Christ, and the Lord added to their number day by day. The life of witness. And now today, we see, starting in Acts chapter 3, the mindset for witness. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a witnessing mindset? A witness mindset. I mean... What is the mindset, loved ones, we need to have day by day, whether we're at home, whether we're on the the bus or in the Uber, whether we're in a workplace, whether we're out walking the dog, what is the mindset of witness that we must have day by day if we are to live faithfully as Christ's witnesses? What's the mindset? Mindset so often determines direction, determines priority. And here's one mindset we see right from Acts 3, 1 to 10 today. The witness mindset is a mindset of expectancy. Expectancy. Now, what does that mean? Here you go, a little definition here. Expectation, write this down. It is the act or state of looking forward or anticipating something. The act or state of looking forward or anticipating. Let me, let's do a little test. When you got out of bed this morning... What was your expectancy like for God to work? Was our mind, was your mind even thinking of that? Or was it so consumed with the tasks of the day? Got to do this, got to do this, and this is happening. Gotta, there's this person, this person, this person. Did you wake up? Did you roll out of bed with a mindset of expectancy? And in this case, when it comes to witness, It is our expectation for Christ's work 
in and through us in each moment as we live on mission as his witnesses by his power. See, here's why this is so important. It's the big idea for the whole sermon. I'm going to restate it in a few minutes again. But it means this, to live as faithful witnesses for Christ, we must live expectantly for the work of Christ. If we are to live, you and I, as faithful witnesses for Christ, we must live expectantly for the work of Christ. Expectantly. Like as God's word goes forth today, as his work is going on, things are going to happen, whether I see it or not. Let me ask you a question, loved ones. I was very convicted by this this week. If God met you at your level of expectation for his work, where would he find you? I was like, that's what you expect of me? That's what I'll give you. I'll say it again. If God met you at your level of expectation for his work, where would he find you? He's like, that's all you think? Okay, that's what you get. See, how about this? Take it down. Your expectation for his work in your home. Is it just another family devotional time? Is it just another simple prayer time for you? Is it? How about this? Your expectation for his work in that Uber. I was so rocked with this real-time example, even yesterday. Walked in to make a routine, quote-unquote, we'll see that in a little bit, routine purchase of something, and the person's heart just, like literally, it was paying for it. And then just out of nowhere, opened. And the on-ramp for the gospel's right there. Literally yesterday. What's your level of expectation? How about this? In the store, in students, in your class, in your workplace, how about this when you come to gather as the church? Are we coming with a mindset of expectancy that even though the temperature's dropping, it's going to be heating up in here? See, are we coming or is it just, okay, I'll just get through the service. Just another service. If God met you there, where would he find you? When's the last time you and I went into those places I've just mentioned and many others with the mindset of, I don't know what Jesus may do, but I know he's at work. He's equipped me and he'll use it for his glory, so I'm stepping up. I'm going to ask the question of that person. I'm going to share the truth with that neighbor. I'm going to pray that prayer with them, you name it. See here, this identifies the problem, doesn't it? You see it and so do I. We often live more with a mindset of disinterest to the work of Christ. A mindset of apathy. A mindset of ho-hum. We get more expectant about going to a senator's game or a concert or whatever our hobby is at that moment than coming to meet on the living God. We embrace what are called expectancy killers. Distraction, the love of our comfort zone, inconvenience, not wanting to be inconvenienced, and many others. And the result, what's the result of this? We embrace these expectancy killers, missed opportunities, unfaithfulness, and that person who God had sovereignly put in our path is one moment closer to hell. I'll say it again, loved ones. To live as a faithful witness for Christ, we must live expectantly for the work of Christ. And here in our text today, we're going to see three, three truths we must believe and increasingly live in light of each day in the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are to not only see the daily opportunities, are we even seeing them? They're all around us. Students, youth, in your schools, opportunities for the gospel, all around you. Are we even seeing them? Are our eyes even open to that? Is our mindset ready for that? 
for the gospel that Jesus puts in front of us, but not only see them, but faithfully step into them and witness Jesus build his kingdom through spirit-empowered gospel witness. You ready to go? One of the biggest things hurting the church today is a lack of expectancy for the work of the Lord. Come on, let's go, church. Let's revive this in us. Come on, Lord, please do that work. Let's stand to honor the authority of God's word. Acts chapter three, verses one to 10. Let's read it together. Love this text. The lame beggar healed. Verse one, let's go nice and loud. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Hear the word of the Lord, all God's people said... Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get after it, Hope. Let's do this. The mindset of witness is expectancy. The mindset of witness is expectancy. First thing, you must believe, if we're going to live with this mindset, day by day, moment by moment, and not let apathy and distraction and all this other stuff take it out, listen, you and I must believe it's never just another moment. It's never just another another moment, not when God's glory is on the agenda. See, every moment is an opportunity. Every moment's an opportunity. Question, are you living with gospel expectancy? Every moment's an opportunity. Are you living with gospel expectancy? Let's get our context. Here we are in Jerusalem, and the festival of Pentecost has just happened, and as I said, the early church is booming, and thousands are being saved as the gospel is preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the church devotes itself to Christ and to one another in living as an uncommon community. We saw with uncommon distinction last week. And now, so we saw the work of the church in the life of the church. And now Acts takes a different turn. And it shows the witness to the broader community in Jerusalem. In the day-to-day life, in the unbelieving world, as they live out their mission. Look at verses 1 to 5 again. Let's go to the text. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried. Just picture this, loved ones. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. All right, here's what's happening. Ninth hour, you're like, what's going on there? It's the ninth hour of the day. You see that in verse one, and that's what? 3 p.m. It's 3 p.m., because in the Jewish tradition, Even to this day, there are three times of prayer. The day began at 6 a.m., and the three times of prayer were at the third hour, 9 a.m., the sixth hour, 12 p.m., and the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Now, let's be clear on something. Peter and John, along with the rest of the Christians of the early church, they kept these times in keeping with Jewish tradition. They kept these times of prayer. They would go to the temple to worship, pray, and witness. That was like their, if you're a fisherman, that was their fishing hole for witnessing the temple grounds. 
All right, where's your fishing hole, huh? Uh huh. Come on. Yeah. Some of you got that. All right, next, next. And you see, here, here's the reality. This was a normal or routine activity for them. They went there day after day after day after day, as did the hundreds, perhaps even thousands of others that went there at those same times with them. And notice where they're at. Go to verse two. It says, where are they? The beautiful gate. Where's the beautiful gate? Okay, here's a picture. Okay, there's the beautiful gate there. See that, that gold door on the front? That's the beautiful gate. And it makes sense that this beggar would be there because that's got the most traffic. The further you go into the temple, the less people are allowed to go. Okay, so there is the entrance to the court of the Gentiles. And then you see a close-up view on there. Next slide. There you go. So this is a court. Now, I just want you to picture this, and it's just packed with people. It's packed. These are the times of prayer. And if you were a devout Jew, you were keeping these times of prayer. What do we know about this man? Okay, so just picture the scene. Crowded, thousands of people rushing all around. There's a guy sitting there. What do we know about him? Well, we know that he's more than 40 years old. You say, where'd you get that? Acts 4.22. Let's just read ahead. Acts 4.22, you know he's more than 40 years old. And he's been lame since birth. Did you see that in verse 2? He's been lame since birth, he, which means this. He's never, well, get this, never walked a step in his life. Not once. And he's asking for alms. What's an alms? A charitable donation of money and goods given to beggars, mostly by those going into the temple. They wanted to posture themselves and look good. See, here's what we know about this man. He's not just broke. He's broken. Okay? This man is not just broke. He's broken. He's humiliated. And he's hopeless. Hey, you know what a newsflash that is? Like the people you and I are surrounded by each day, perhaps even people right now in this room. Broken and feeling hopeless. Even though, we're good at this, even though we like to package ourselves, don't we? Everything's good. I'm good. But inside, we're crying out. And yet, notice this, when this beggar interrupts Peter and John and asks for alms, instead of simply tossing some money into the lap of the man, Peter and John direct their gaze at him. Do you see in verse 4? It means they gave him their undivided attention. It wasn't like they were walking past and scrolling on their first century iPhone. No, I'm just, no, oh, hey, yeah, okay, here's a little hand. And just going about their business. They weren't distracted by trying to keep their schedule at all costs. I don't have time for you. Don't we, don't we, let's just sit under the word of the Lord for a moment. When we say this, we see the people around us like, nope, I got my schedule. I'm driving, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Can't be interrupted. You feel that? So do I. My schedule at all costs, my convenience, my efficiency. And notice what they do. They ask him to look at them. Verse four, and the man does. Probably for the first time in a long time, this man had someone direct their attention to him. So just put yourself, put yourself, loved ones, live in the text, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Going up to the temple to pray it's just this normal everyday routine. What's your normal everyday routines? You have them? Well, when I get up, I do this, and then I go this, and then I, here's the drive, and then I go to the Timmy's drive through and I get the coffee from that same lady every single day, and blah, blah, blah. we have our elders meeting sometimes in Timmy's, and I know those same people are coming with the same workers. See them every day. It's just a normal daily routine for you. You've seen this guy before many times. He's been sitting there for 40 years daily. You've walked past him many times already. And it would be so easy for you to miss how the Lord wanted to work in a fresh way in that situation because it's so mundane. It's so routine. And no doubt there were hundreds, perhaps even thousands of noisy people moving towards the temple in this rush so that they could get in on time for evening prayer session. But right in the middle of that, Put the, you got those temple pictures? Yeah, there you go. Right in the middle of it. Question, would you see the opportunity right there? It's in front of you. 
Would you see it? Or you just move past? I got to get it. My schedule. I got to go. Would you see it? See, this is a God-given moment of interruption for you. This is a God-given moment of interruption. I want you to think of your daily routines. What are the God-given moments of interruption there? Hey, listen, would you take it? You're walking in that temple. You've got the deadline, the clock's ticking. Would you take the moment? Would you engage the quote-unquote interruption? See, at this point, you and I would have a choice to make. We either engage the interruption quote unquote, or we miss the moment for gospel impact. How many moments are we missing? See, here's what we need to understand. You'll see it on the screen. Where our flesh sees interruptions to avoid, God sees investments to make. I'll say it again. Where our flesh, me first, my agenda, my schedule, no expectancy. I just got to do my thing every day, the same thing. Where our flesh sees interruptions to avoid to that. God sees investments to make. And so often we would say this, and i so convicted by this message this week. So often it's like, you're getting in my way. Don't you know I got to get things done? This is not a timely interruption. You're getting in my way. And God's like, really? I put them in your way. I put them in your way. What are we going to do? See, every moment is an opportunity. Are you living with gospel expectancy? See, remember, remember this. Big idea of the text right here. Expectation of Christ's work positions us for faithfulness in Christ's work. Loved ones, there are people whom God has put around you and me literally every day who are crying out for the intentional gospel investment into their lives. And they're not going to get it from anywhere else. They're not going to get it from the world. They can't. And nobody wants to invest in those people that you see, you and I see day after day, laid daily in front of us than Jesus. But, hope, do we live with a witness mindset of expectancy for him to give us fresh opportunities to show himself powerful on our behalf in those quote-unquote normal mundane moments, places, and with people that we're in and around each day? See, it's so easy to be distracted from this, isn't it? It's so easy. I'm too busy. I don't have time. But here, here's the thing that I was rocked with, loved ones. Did you ever notice this? Maybe just me. God rarely works on our schedules. You ever notice that? God rarely, if ever, works on our schedules when it would be nice and tidy to meet this man. I got a margin of about 15 minutes, okay. He rarely works on our schedules. We think, well, or we can fall in this mindset of, oh, it's just the mundane, it's just the routine. Jesus doesn't really care about the mundane. It's just another Saturday night service. I'm waiting for the conference. Mm. Really? Where's the expectancy? Same God, same word, same spirit. Let's go. I'll get around to it in a different season. Hey, can I just, I've said that so much. And then I was struck with this question. What if there isn't another season? For you or that person. What if there isn't another season? Did you ever notice the whole thing? My wife and I were talking about this recently. We, we tend to say, when things settle down, you know where I'm going with this. When things settle down, then we'll spend more time investing. Then we'll live with more intentionality on witness. When things slow down a bit, how's that working for you? Just, just saying. Is it working for you about as well as for us? When things just slow down, then I'll be more invested. Loved ones, look. John 4, 35, you'll see it on the screen. Jesus says to his disciples, do you not say there are yet four months, then the harvest? It's down there. It's a few months away. 
Look, Jesus says, I tell you, commands us, lift up your eyes. Obadawa, lift up our eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Lift up your eyes, get them off our phones. Get them off Netflix. Get them off our stuff. Get them off our self. Get them off our agenda and see the fields are white. They're white for harvest. I'll never forget the story. We were, in Bar- we were going up to Barry and we stopped at a, a fast food restaurant on the way up and you could just see, I remember this standing in line and this one person at the till there was just a heaviness about them. You see that? Someone's just feeling really heavy. They're really down. Person after person just going by. And we get up to the counter and, and I said, hey. She, just like, just like, she wouldn't even look up. She was like, what can I get you? And I was like, hey, can you just look at me for a sec? And she looks up. And I said, I just want you to know you have a God that loves you, that created you for his glory. And she just, poof, right in the middle of this Crazy, busy fast food restaurant. Just done. And she wipes the tears and she's like, you have no idea how much I needed to hear that. I said, Jesus, it's made a way for you to not feel hopeless. You have value to him. It's just in tears. But was it just about getting your dinner? Man, I, and that's like one time. I'm not a superhero. Trust me. I miss many moments. Lord, help us. They're all around us. The fields are white. Who are the people around you that God has, look at the text, laid daily, verse two. Who has God laid daily in front of you? And he's asking you to interrupt your important schedule to pursue on his behalf to sow seed for eternal impact. Here it is. How about your spouse? We're taking time for one another. We're married. How about this? Our children. You ever notice um, parenting is inconvenient to our agendas? Pretty inconvenient. Like, I got to get this done, and I got this done, and I'll clean the house, and then we'll do work, and then it's a, I just have to, can, can I just talk to you for a sec, Dad? You're like, Yes! Quick! Like, it's just, it's all, the pressure is all there. All around us. Coworkers, friends, neighbors, in the church. Who's been laid daily? Is it an interruption to you or an investment? See, the mindset of witness is expectation. Expectancy. That God will work. He's ordained it in his sovereignty for that moment. And that's why it's never just another moment we must believe. Jesus lived by a divine timetable. And if we are Christians in his image, we're living by one too. We're on a divine timetable, loved ones. Whose timetable are you living by? Every moment is an opportunity. Why? Because it's never just another name. It's never just another name. The power is in the name of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Will you and I believe he's enough in that moment? It's never just another moment because it's never just another name. The power is in the name of Jesus. Look at verse six. Go back to this amazing text. Verse six. But Peter said, so here's this guy asking. They, they give him their attention. He looks up at them. Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. See, this man is in for the shock of his life. He's in for the shock of his life. He was about to receive something, all right, but it was nothing that what he expected it to be. Instead of giving this man, just hand out stretch, can you just see it? Just hand out stretch, looking up at their face. Instead of giving him the silver and gold he was hoping for, Peter offers him nothing less than the power and presence of Jesus Christ. That's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus 
as we'll see again, Lord willing, next week, it, it includes all that Jesus is and all that he has done. Okay, it's the person of Jesus. I have Jesus to offer you. It's all Peter had and it's all that was needed. How do you know? Look at verse seven and eight. Go back to the text right here, seven and eight. And so what does Peter do? He took him by the right hand, right here. He took him by the hand. Can you just see that right outside that gate? All the people passing by. Hurry, 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 hurry. Peter steps down. He took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately, what a moment, huh? Immediately, his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Did you ever hear the children's worship song about that? You know, walking and leaping and praising God. Come on, guys. Come on. Kids worship. Come on. I can't get that out of my head. Every time, walking and leaping, praise. You got to go on Spotify and just go walking and leaping. You'll get it. I almost put it on the Spotify playlist for this week, for this service. Because it's amazing. That's right. And so here he is. He's leaping. Now, verse 8, the Greek word there for leaping means to bubble. He's like this. Bubble or spring up. It's a picture right there. You'll see it on the screen. Boom, like a fountain. Guy just shoots up. After 40 years, he just shoots right up. This guy, after 40 years, immediately gets up, starts walking and leaping, praising God. But can I just say two things? Number one, by the way, Acts is a historical narrative, right? You know what that means? This actually happened. This is true, 100% true. This actually happened. And the second thing we need to see from this is this. Peter had to be willing to take the step of faith to engage the guy. He had to respond to the faith given to him by the Lord. To see this, what would have missed? What would have... Live in the text. Okay, live in the text. What would you be thinking right now if you were Peter? You have this God-given opportunity right in front of you, yet you have nothing to give this man. Do you ever feel that way when you're witnessing? You just feel like, I got nothing to give. I don't have the words. I don't have the stuff. I don't, I don't have the knowledge. What if they say these things and I don't know how to respond to them? You ever feel like that? You got nothing to give? You do have something to give. The love and power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who's living in you. You are saved. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. Would he have been enough for you as he was for Peter in this moment? Is he today? See, today so often we think we can't step into what Jesus is calling us to because we don't think we're equipped we don't think we have the right words. We don't have the relationships. Well, when I get a better relationship, then I'll open up about God. You know, one of the things my wife and I just committed to as we just moved in at the end of July was I don't want our neighbors to have to wait a year before they find out I'm a pastor. That's usually a buzzkill in relationships. But we're just like, whatever it takes, Lord, we move to be closer to people for that reason. What do you do? I'm a pastor. And they're like, uh, I'm like, you want me to shovel your driveway? I'm like, what? Let's go do that. And they're like, what? And you know what was really cool? We had a birthday party. My two older boys. All these non believers, a couple of y'all were there. Praise the Lord. Love it. Love it. But we had all these non believers from the neighborhood, this massive street hockey game. I would say almost every kid in the neighborhood was playing. All these kids we didn't even invite. We got overrun because they saw the other kids playing and then they just came. And we're like, bring it on, whatever. Parents was like, you want to take them? I'm like, yeah, sure, go. Okay, cool. So then they come in the house after the game. We have dinner. I said, everybody in the living room, open up God's word and just preach the gospel to them for like 15, 20 minutes straight. Almost the entire neighborhood of kids. I don't want to wait for people to know I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Do you? 
would you miss the moment? Or take it in a fear of the Lord and not a fear of man. Lord, help us, amen? We don't think we're equipped, so we don't step into it. We won't have the right training. We won't have the right words. We won't know what to say. And so as a result of that thinking, we lose the mindset of expectancy and we begin to rely on ourselves and our abilities. And we begin to doubt God's ability to work for his glory in us and through us in that situation. See, here's what a faithful witness will realize. Here's what we must realize. You'll see it on the screen. In Jesus Christ, you and I have everything you need to do everything that he's calling you to do right now. In Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I have everything that we need to do everything he's asking us to do right now and with who he's asking us to do it with. Everything. He gave everything to Peter right here. And it didn't involve gold. It didn't involve what this world says this guy should have. It was all Jesus. We've been given it through the gospel, through faith in Jesus Christ, through believing that he's the son of God. And he came to earth, fully God, fully man. And he lived a perfect life, didn't sin once. He overcame the sin, went to the cross, paid the penalty for that sin. He took the wrath of God, God's hatred against sin for you and I. That was our place he took. And he died and rose again three days later, defeating the power of paralysis, defeating the power of sin, defeating the power of death, defeating the power of the hardened heart. And now in him, as we repent of our sin and confess him as Lord and Savior, he gives us all we need to live on mission as his witnesses. You be encouraged, loved ones. The power is not in the messenger. The power for witness is in the one who fills the witnesses. The power for witness is always in the one who fills the witness, not in the messenger. The power behind him. All God's faith, all his strength, all his love, all his courage, all his compassion, all his authority and boldness that he gives us. Yes. Will you trust him? Will you believe he's enough? The power's in the name of Jesus. Because here's the truth we need to understand. We don't have to go looking for opportunities. What we see all throughout the book of Acts, all throughout scripture, and all throughout our lives is this. 90% of being faithful is just showing up. Show up and make yourself available for that conversation. Don't be so driven on your own agenda. Show up. See, and here's something I want you to be encouraged with. Jesus is not looking for your ability or mine. He's not like, well, you get your apologetic arguments all lined up and then I'll do it. He's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. Will you go? He's looking for your availability and mine. Why? Because the power to witness, the power to change a life is not coming from you or I. It comes from the Holy Spirit inside of us, filling the messenger. And your responsibility and mine, take ourselves off the hook. Your responsibility and mine is never to transform a life. It is to engage the life in the power of the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit transform it for his glory, how he wants to, when, where, and why. Salvation is only God's work from start to finish. It's not on you or I. Peter didn't even take a second lick on saying, well, what should be my strategy for preaching the gospel? Bam, the Lord gave the faith. Peter stepped in. Will you and I? Jesus was enough. Peter's dependency was not on himself. Where's your dependency on your witness? Is Jesus enough for you? Are you living a life of expectant engagement? Expectant. Knowing the power of Jesus is enough to give that person all that they long for. Loved one, we don't know how God will use it, but we know he will. 
See, living with expectancy begins by repenting of our unbelief in the power and presence of Jesus. We think, well, yeah, I've got Jesus, but and. Jesus and my ability to convince. Jesus and my relationship with that person. Jesus and it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Where do you need to repent of your unbelief in the power and presence in the name of Jesus? Think of that coworker. Think of that family member. Think of the spouse. Think of the prodigal child right now. You think Jesus is enough to give? You bet he is. Let's repent of our unbelief. Here, here's another one. Repenting of our prideful dependence on ourselves and other things to do what only Jesus can. Let's repent of our excuses we make for not engaging the life that is right in front of us. Let's repent that we care more about getting our lattes on time than engaging the person with the gospel. Let's repent of our love for self more than a love for him and those around us and cry out, Lord, increase my faith. I believe you're enough. I believe in your power. I believe in your holiness. I believe in your message. I believe in your grace. I believe in your love. I believe in your kindness that leads to repentance and that you will use me in my inadequacy, but help my unbelief. I'm so prone to wander. Here I am, use me. Here I am, send me. You don't have to look far. Fields are white. See, the mindset of witness is expectancy. It starts by believing it's never just another moment. Every moment's an opportunity. Hey, high school students, you know I pray for you every day. I love you very much. It's never just another class you're in. You have the, if you are saved in Jesus Christ, he lives in you. And he's given you all you need to do exactly what he's called you to do there. And he's exactly what all those classmates of yours truly long for, and they don't know it. Step in. Step in, in his power. It's never just another name. Power's in the name of Jesus. And when you step out in his name, we must believe this. Final point today, it's this. We must believe it's never just an isolated act. It's never just an isolated act. Like God will work in this little silo and that's it. Uh uh uh. Faithfulness is multiplied. Faithfulness is multiplied. God will see to that. But will you trust even when you can't see it? Faithfulness is multiplied. Look at, go back to the text. The big finish here, nine and 10. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. So there's thousands of people in the temple courtyard. They see this guy that they've walked by for 40 years. This guy's walking. He's leaping. He's praising God. And they're like, look at 10. And they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And what's the impact? They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. See, after the man's raised up, All the people, hundreds, thousands of people who knew this man and had seen him sitting outside the temple the last 40 years, they couldn't help but be filled with awe. Of course they're filled at the power of God in changing this man's life. You see that in verse 10. And if that wasn't enough, notice this. The impact of God, the impact of the gospel through one man not only displayed God's glory, not only displayed the truth of Jesus, the truth of the gospel to all who recognized him, but it continues to display his glory through Peter's preaching of the gospel that came in response to this act. And Lord willing, we'll look at it 11 to 26 next week. Read ahead, get your heart primed. We'll see the impact of that. And Acts 4.4 goes on to tell us that as a result, people saw what happened. Peter steps up to preach. He declares an incredible sermon by the power of the Holy Spirit, and as a result, the church then grew to 5,000 men, not even including women at that time, and the scholars estimate the church grew to 10,000 people. Faithfulness is multiplied. They saw what God did. They heard the truth of the gospel, and they responded by the power and grace of God. 
See, not only this, but did you check this out? Not, that wasn't the only multiplication, as if that's not staggering enough. But this event, what are we doing right now? This event continues to impact our lives here today and the lives of the millions of people around the world, all through one act of God, through one inadequate servant of God who stepped into the mundane and the routine, was faithful to engage the so-called interruption and expected God to work through it. And you know what's really amazing? We'll get into more of this next week. Lord willing. But what's really amazing? You know why Jesus healed this guy? He gave a glimpse of the kingdom to come. The life that is waiting for all who repent of their sin and trust in him as their savior. When Jesus comes back and establishes the kingdom, there's no more paralysis. That's the truth of the gospel. There's no more death. There's no more sickness. There's no more hopelessness. There's life and freedom and joy. He's coming soon. And can I encourage us with this as we head out this week? Loved ones, supernatural acts of God begin with ordinary acts of obedience. Peter just stepped up. Filled with faith, the Holy Spirit stepped up and engaged it. Supernatural acts of God and thousands of people. That person in, your ne- in the cubicle next to you might be the next Apostle Paul. That student, loved ones in school who you think is too hard, who's too turned off, might be the next missionary. It's not for you and I to decide how God's going to use it, but to trust that he will. See, supernatural acts of God begin with ordinary acts of obedience, and there is literally nothing insignificant when it's done for the kingdom of heaven. Right now, I was talking to a guy who's in the nursery today. Talking to a guy before the service. Been looking forward to the nursery, going in. I said, oh yeah, you pray your face off over those young people. You have no idea how the Lord answers every one of those prayers. Faithfulness is multiplied. Gentlemen, never think you're too tough for the nursery. Faithfulness is multiplied. There's nothing insignificant. It's never just another conversation. In your jobs, in your neighborhoods, in your playgroups, in your classes, serving in the church. That's why it's never just another Saturday. When you guys open the word of God in devotions, when you step up and sacrifice your time and talents to see, it's never Just another moment. See, and like I said, it's not our job to understand how God will use it for his glory. But it is our job, commissioned by God, to walk in faithful and expectant obedience in his power, knowing he is going to use it. Don't give up just because you don't think you can say, hey mom, hey dad, don't give up opening the word of God with your children just because you don't think you can see the fruit. Don't give up praying over their lives because you don't see how God's at work. Don't give up praying for your spouse. Don't give up praying for that lost neighbor or coworker. Do not give up. Faithfulness will be multiplied. We don't know how. But we can trust that God will use it all. He will use it all for his glory and your good. So question, final question today. Who's been laid daily in front of you that God is calling you to engage for his glory? Who's laid daily? If you're here and you've never trusted in Christ as your personal savior, um, God has laid you here right now to hear this truth. This physical healing is the picture of the spiritual healing that doesn't focus on healing of the legs. It heals the heart. It replaces the heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And he's laid you daily right here. You hear it. How will you respond to that? And have eternal life today through repentance and confession of Jesus as Lord. And brothers and sisters in Christ, you've made that decision. Remember this big idea. 
to live as faithful witnesses for Christ, we must live expectant for the work of Christ. The fields are white, Hope Ottawa. Let's go. Let's pray. But Jesus Christ, you have all authority over paralysis. You have all authority over depression. You have all authority over sickness. You have all authority over death. You have all authority over every life. You created every single one of us for your glory. Lord, I pray right now, you would just be putting on our hearts those people that you have laid daily. And I pray that you would find a church mobilized for witness by the power of the Holy Spirit, fervent, passionate, expectant, that when we go into our homes, when we go into that restaurant, when we go into the school, when we go into our neighborhoods, it's never just another moment. Lord, help us to live with that eternal perspective our eyes fixed on Jesus, our minds set on things above. And I pray right now, I pray right now for anyone in this room who has yet to call on you as Lord and Savior and repent of their sin. And I pray they would look at the physical healing of this man and be overwhelmed and just have no doubt anymore in who you are and be like, Lord, I need you. I want the spiritual life that can only come through you, eternal life, the forgiveness of sin. That only comes through your name. Lord, the fields are white. Find us faithful. Jesus, you are over everything. And we entrust it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Hope, let's respond. Some passionate worship. Let's go.